Liebe Corinne, meine Damen und Herren, ich muss für das Sprechen in Englisch zu ein, ein, entschuldigen. Wir Engländer haben den großen Nachteil, dass wir die weltweit gemeinsame Sprache sprechen. Und deshalb wir die Angewohnheit zu sprechen alles andere verloren haben. Dies ist ein großer Fehler und die Welt müssen uns zu vergeben, obwohl ich bezweifle, dass es wird. Auf jeden Fall, ich mache weiter auf Englisch. So. Now, oh, moment. So many people in modern societies feel themselves to be entirely powerless. They contemplate in bewilderment the huge and unpredictable forces that surround them. They feel their small world constantly invaded and rearranged as a result of decisions taken by people whom they do not know and cannot influence. They watch as huge and unimaginable fortunes are suddenly bestowed on people who have done nothing to earn them, while others end a lifetime of honest labor with nothing to show for it apart from a worn out body and a troubled soul. Uh, so, and of course we are apt to blame the big people, as we see in Google and Facebook. Now it is fair to say that this sense of powerlessness is, in our Western societies, an illusion. Uh, people have as much power as they need in order to pursue their lives according to their wishes. The law grants to all people the right to go about their business undisturbed, to own property, to engage in free transactions, to love whom they will, and to produce children of their own. The freedoms that we enjoy are sufficient, properly used, to lead a fulfilled life according to plans of our own. If it doesn't feel like that, it is because we fail to see that control over our own private lives is all the power that we need. We fail to see that the greatest achievement of politics and the result that guarantees all the other forms of power that are needed to pursue it is the sovereignty of the individual. How we use that sovereignty is up to us. Some will squander it, some will hoard it, Some will use it wisely in order to express their will and to pursue their own fulfillment. We feel powerless when we contrast this great, great gift of sovereignty with something else that has little or nothing to do with it, the ability to purchase privileges, to accumulate resources, and to proceed through life as though never obliged to court the consent of others to what one is and does. But that feeling of powerlessness is an illusion born of resentment. The truly free person does not feel it, since resentment has been banished from his mind. The truly free person is the one who feels pleasure in the good fortune of others, and who does not envy them because he does not want what they have. In a, <clears throat> so in a world where the sovereignty of the individual is guaranteed, even the wealthy and the privileged owe their power, directly or indirectly, to the consent of others. They too must live by agreement and not by force, and even if it is easier for them to purchase that agreement, consent matters as much to them as it does to the rest of us. This fact lies, it seems to me, at the very foundation of Western democracy. Because we each enjoy sovereignty over our own lives, we can give or withhold our consent in all the normal transactions of our daily lives. How to confer uh, and maintain that sovereignty is or ought to be the major question of political philosophy in our time. That's the last of my, oh, hang on, it's all gone. The last of my little um, things there. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it is to this goal that the discussion of human rights must be directed. How do we define those rights and how do we protect them? And of course, there are vast disagreements here, disagreements within Europe itself, and of course, between Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, and um, discussion of this issue uh, uh, always turns me back to the great essay by Václav Havel entitled The Power of the Powerless, uh, written in the wake of Charter 77, uh, the document 
uh, that confronted the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia with the fact of its own illegitimacy. Now, people do not now show much understanding of what communism meant to the people of East and Central Europe. Uh, and in particular, they do not see that it was not a straightforward tyranny kept in by force. It was a self-perpetuating system that survived by creating its own kind of equilibrium among those who were subjected to it. People cooperated in their own enslavement, enjoying sparse but real material comforts in exchange for submission to a mechanical and impersonal power. In such a system, they are in charge, not we. But we don't really know who they are. As in Kafka's great allegory of the castle, if you trace power to its source, you find another powerless person. The instructions come from on high, but those on high are obeying instructions. There is a closed circle of obedience in which all are receiving orders, but nobody is giving them. At least so it seems. And nobody can say this or even perceive it without exposing himself to the greatest risk. Even in such a system, there is a kind of social contract at work, however. Surrender your sovereignty, the system says, and I will guarantee your security. Assert it, and you enter the unknown, where only punishment is certain. Now, what makes this possible? Havel made uh, various suggestions, but the most interesting one is this. Again, this is the last of my little propositions. In the post-totalitarian world, as he called it, people learn to live within the lie. Truth loses its central place in the affairs of government and is replaced by ideology. By ideology, he meant a set of doctrines, slogans, epithets, and exhortations which arose from a long refuted theory, the, the Marxist theory of society, which were, but which remain in place, keeping vigil over human discourse like corpses which stand to attention before every exit, snarling mechanically at anyone who tries to pass. Um, I, I first came to communist Czechoslovakia in 1979 at a time of great tension all across, across Eastern Europe. I didn't understand very much about how people lived under communism, but the feeling of communism came to me immediately, like a slap in the face. And I'm sure there are other people in this room who've had that experience. Without knowing the exact cause, I found myself surrounded and invaded by fear. I saw faces that did not smile except sarcastically, that did not look at you except suspiciously, that did not speak except in whispers. And in everything, I felt the touch of a mysterious aggression. It was as though the whole country were under threat from a secret enemy, and no one knew whence the first blow would come. It was this experience that helped me to see exactly what Havel meant when he referred to the powerless, since I had suddenly become one. One of the most striking manifestations of the power by which I found myself surrounded was the proliferation on every building and in every public space uh, of the ideological slogans. Unlike the Czechs and Slovaks, who were used to these great signs, which declared the commitment to the socialist future, the fight for peace, fraternal relations with the Soviet people, the big no to capitalist oppression, and so on, I could not take my eyes away from these barefaced lies, not least because they corresponded to the lies taught to students in our own Marxist university departments. As Havel memorably wrote, the customers of the greengrocer who places the sign bearing the words, workers of the world unite in his window, uh, notice only that today there are carrots, but no tomatoes. Like the greengrocer, they treat the official words as irrelevant, ritual formulae which are repeated because required, like the amen at the end of a prayer, and which have no significance in themselves. Perhaps uh, the most important thing that I learned on my subsequent visits was that ideology is not thought, but its opposite, the thing that makes thinking impossible by blocking up the channels through which truth can enter the mind. As Havel put the point, I'm going to give you a long quotation here, 
Uh, the post-totalitarian system touches people at every step, but it does so with its ideological gloves on. This is why the life in the system is so thoroughly permeated with hypocrisy and lies. Government by bureaucracy is called popular government. The working class is enslaved in the name of the working class. The complete degradation of the individual is presented as his ultimate liberation. Depriving people of information is called making it available. The use of power to manipulate is called the public control of power. And the arbitrary abuse of power is called observing the legal code. The repression of culture is called its development. The expansion of imperial influence is presented as support for the oppressed. The lack of free expression becomes the highest form of freedom. Farcical elections become the highest form of democracy. Banning independent thought becomes the most scientific of worldviews. Military occupation becomes fraternal assistance. Because the regime is captive to its own lies, it must falsify everything. It falsifies the past, it falsifies the present, and it falsifies the future. It falsifies statistics. It pretends not to possess an omnipotent and unprincipled police apparatus. It pretends to respect human rights. It pretends to persecute no one. It pretends to fear nothing. It pretends to pretend nothing. Well, that's all summarized in that last little sentence. Uh, <clears throat> I had traveled in order to address a private seminar in Prague, and as a result, I fell in with a group of young people who, for a variety of reasons, had been excluded from the educational system and who were hungry for the information that I had brought to them from afar. I quickly came to see that they were not, in any real sense, dissidents. They were not people who had shaped their lives as opponents of the system or followers of some rival ideology. Like Havel, I learned to put the word dissident in inverted commas. Uh, and so I think I haven't got to... Have I got there? Yes. No, yes, sorry. Uh, uh, um. I'm on back here. Sorry, at my fault. Um, like Havel, I learned to put the word dissident in inverted commas. Uh, for the people I met were simply those who had retreated to another place beneath the city, a strange and quiet catacomb where they tried to live in truth. Living in truth brought fatigue and privations, and never has its atmosphere been so effectively caught as by Havel himself in his play Lago Desolato, written in 1984, and first appearing in Samizdat after my visits came to an end following my arrest and expulsion. Havel had seen, with characteristic insight, that where the ruling power has no authority, uh, the search for authority, even if it is only a charismatic and personal authority, brings power of another kind, power that is effective in ways that the uh, authorities, as they ironically called themselves, could not hope to enjoy. This was the power to move people's hearts and souls and to join with them in what the philosopher Patochka called the solidarity of the shattered. It was a power that came from placing truth where it belongs, at the center of your life and at the beginning and end of your discourse. Havel captured the idea in memorable words, another quotation from him. The crust presented by the life of lies is made of strange stuff. As long as it seals off hermetically the entire society, it appears to be made of stone. But the moment someone breaks through in one place, when one person cries out, the emperor is naked, when a single person breaks the rules of the game, thus exposing it as a game, everything suddenly appears in another light, and the whole crust seems then to be made of a tissue on the point of tearing and disintegrating uncontrollably. So Havel had burst through that crust and been immediately seized and punished for doing so. A great effort had been made to repair the crust so that the illusion could be restored that it was made of stone. But beneath the crust, in a system of catacombs dug out over years, young people were experimenting with the thing that the system denied, which was sovereignty. They were making choices for their lives and endeavoring to live in truth. To be part of that endeavor was, for me, a transforming experience. Over the years, working together with Western colleagues, I joined the underground university in Prague and Brno, which was not so much a university 
as a network of sympathy in which art, music, philosophy, history and literature were wrapped together in classes designed to teach the habit of distinguishing the true from the false. Uh, <clears throat> I was not optimistic that it would lead uh, to anything at all. Unlike Havel, I was convinced that, my, uh, that the crust above my head was made of stone. But it was a moving and instructive experience to find myself among people for whom the most important question to be asked of anything you said was whether it was true, and if so, what followed. I came to understand then the extent to which the ideological disease had penetrated Western universities also, and the extent to which living in truth is a challenge in every place where career and comfort conflict with it. Well, you might say, <clears throat> all that may be interesting enough, but it belongs to the past, to a bleak period of, human, uh, of European history from which we have moved on. It is no longer relevant to our problems today. However, that is not the conclusion that I draw, and I will conclude this talk by saying why. In, in, place, in placing truth at the center of their lives, my friends and students of those days were also affirming their sovereignty against the, uh, the system. Although the sphere of their choice was narrow and the light in the catacombs pale and vacillating, they had recognized the deep connection between truth and freedom. To live in truth means to take responsibility for what you think and say. You become answerable for your words, your beliefs, your vision of the world. And this is the very opposite of the life required by ideology. Everywhere you confront the question posed by others and by the life around you, whether what you think or say is true. The question is hard. You don't answer it by avoiding it, and if you answer it sincerely, you must also live by what you say. But if you are responsible for your beliefs, how much more are you responsible for your actions, for your feelings, for your posture towards others and the world? This was what was taught by the life in truth, namely responsibility, uh, or Verantwortung as, as you know it here. You are not free just because you can do what you want to satisfy your appetites. The post-totalitarian system was constructed by organizing people's appetites so that they could easily obey them. They did what they wanted, but, it, but they did it without consulting others, without evaluating their own actions, without taking responsibility for their shared Lebenswelt. True sovereignty, true freedom, true responsibility are all one and the same a posture towards the world that it is natural for us to acquire, but which can also be easily destroyed by fear and manipulation. The people whom I knew in the catacombs were keeping alive the habits that make it possible to take responsibility for the way things are. It is, in my view, no accident that the first two prime ministers of the Czech and Slovak lands were graduates of our underground university or that so many subsequently prominent figures were educated there. For all the troubles and uncertainties that followed the collapse, for, sorry, for all the troubles and uncertainties that followed the collapse of the Berlin Wall, it has been understood that the new society depends upon the consent of its members, that you can build, build consent only through the sovereignty of the individual, and that sovereignty uh, means responsibility. And here I would venture to draw a contrast with the so-called Arab Spring. In the days of Gaddafi in Libya, people were powerless as they were under communism in Eastern Europe, but they were also oppressed. They were not asked to cooperate in their enslavement, they were simply given no choice in the matter. And there were no catacombs, no networks or structures that kept alive the memory of another way of, of being. The default position for Libyans, then as now, was the retreat into the shade of the Quran, as Said Qutb described it. To give up on politics, on freedom, and on sovereignty, and to submit to a document that purports to be the word of God, and which promises rewards in another world than this one. In such circumstances, you can remove the tyrant, as we have seen, and people will cooperate in helping you. There will be a moment of rejoicing, 
but no one will come forward with plans for a new kind of government in which the sovereignty of the individual would be put at the top of the agenda. The only person to come forward is the next tyrant or the gang of ardent young men who are looking for him and seeking to install him. Of course, there, there are many other factors at work in the chaos of the Middle East than the lack of the underground networks of powerless people. Nevertheless, in the circumstances that prevailed in that region prior to the Arab Spring, the powerless did not exercise their power. There was not, as there was in East and Central Europe, the memory of another kind of power than the one under which people suffered. The only idea for a better future was to replace the powerful, not to advance the powerless. The kind of power of which Havel wrote is precisely not exercised through coercion, dominion, or violence. It is the power that resides in truth itself, in the ability to stand before the other in open dialogue and to recognize that he has the right to disagree. <clears throat> what is it about our history and our social institutions that makes it so easy for us to see that there is power of that kind and that the powerless too can enjoy it? Let me venture a suggestion. We Europeans are products of a religion and a political tradition that have put the sovereign individual at the heart of the moral order. We accept the need for government, but only if it is limited government, which leaves the sphere of individual choice intact. We see the role of government in the religious life as that of guaranteeing religious freedom rather than imposing religious conformity. And while we accept the right of governments to tax us and to regulate our economic life, we are jealous of our free agreements and resist the attempts by governments to undo or control them. All this comes from a long tradition of taking responsibility for our lives, of confessing to our faults and trying to rectify them, of accepting that the truth is more important than the fictions that make it easy to be governed. And the great question in my mind is whether that long tradition is coming to an end. Many people warn us now against the increasing level of censorship in our societies, against the intrusive presence of the managerial state in all our decisions, against the ways in which associations are controlled and opinions anathematized in the name of emerging secular orthodoxies. And if these warnings are in any way justified, perhaps we need again to take a lesson from Havel and recognize that the powerless too have power in the face of them. Maybe the time has come once again to dig those catacombs and to build in them the shrines to our civilization that will keep the memory of it alive. Thank you. Thank you.